All right, let's consider the graph of first ionization energies describing the correlation of the atomic number in terms of what you know about the ionization energy trend. What do the large ionization energy dips represent from argon to potassium, krypton to rubidium, and xenon to cesium? Okay, so this is a really useful question for us to understand. We understand that the ionization energy trend, right, for the ionization energy trend, we know that ionization energy increases to the right of a period and also increases up a group, right? So we understand that to the right of a period, the atomic number increases. So as a result, the nuclear charge increases. And because the nuclear charge increases, the effect of nuclear charge or the effect of the nuclear charge on a particular electron tends to increase. And because the effect of nuclear charge increases, the force of attraction that governs specifically the valence electrons, the, um, the furthest electrons from the nucleus, is going to be higher. And because the force of attraction is higher, the ionization energy or the energy needed to remove valence electrons is going to be higher, right? You see, you need more energy to pry them apart. Right? And furthermore, if we go up a group, we can understand that the shell number decreases, right? So if the shell number decreases, then therefore there are less core electron shells. Oh, sorry about that. Why does that keep doing? Okay, so there's less core electron shells. So there's less core electron shells, and as a result, there is a less of an impact of shielding, right? So because we don't have these core electron shells, we have less shielding. Because we have less shielding, then therefore, the force of attract the effect of nuclear charge is going to be it won't be as disrupted, right? So the effect of nuclear charge increases. And as a result, the force of attraction increases. Because there's a larger force of attraction, we can understand that there is more energy needed to remove the valence electrons. So we understand that. So as we go from lithium to helium um, to neon to argon, right, as we go to the right of a period, now we can understand that from helium to lithium, we're going to a different group, right? So if I just kind of show you guys this, I'm just going to insert a periodic table here. Okay, so here's our periodic table. Just put that there. We can kind of use it. So if we take a look at um, this graph here, as well as just gonna move this guy up. Okay, so say if we take a look at this graph and we look at this periodic table, we can see that on the x-axis. The atomic number is increasing, right? So you can see that uh, lithium um, is going to be a higher atomic number than helium and so forth, right? So here you have helium, lithium, uh, neon, sodium, argon, potassium. You can see that helium, which we can put up here, lithium are in two different groups, right? So we can understand that the ionization energy of lithium is going to be lower than helium, and we're looking at the first ionization energy, or the energy needed to remove the first electron, we can see that the energy associated with lithium is lower than helium because of the fact that lithium is located down a group, right? So we know that ionization energy decreases down a group. So that, that's consistent, right? Neon is basically to the right of uh, lithium on the period, and neon has a higher ionization energy, or first ionization energy, than lithium. Okay, so th these trends make complete sense, right? We're basically using the, our general ionization energy trend. This was the increasing trend. The decreasing trend, I'm gonna do this in blue, is gonna decrease down a group and to the left of the group. So that's why lithium has a lower first ionization energy than helium. Neon has a higher first ionization energy than lithium and so forth. Now, what we wanna really understand here is when we go from um, one group to the other, so from helium to lithium, from neon to sodium, from argon to potassium, why do we have these really large dips? So you can, you can see these really large dips in ionization energies. I wanna explain this. Why is there this large ionization energy dip? Well, it's because we're going to a different energy level, right? Because we're getting into a new energy level, this tells us that we're gonna have significant impact of shielding, right? So all of these, um, these dips are explained by um, basically the ascension to a new shell, right? So you're going from argon to potassium, you're going to a new shell. And because of that, 
we can basically look at uh, this notion that as you go as you go down a group, right, the shell number increases, and as a result, the core electron shells will tend uh, to increase, and as a result, you have more shielding, and as a result, you have a weaker effective nuclear charge. So the effective nuclear charge diminishes, and the force of attraction also diminishes. So the ionization energy decreases. Now. That one's pretty straightforward. Now, the only thing that we need to kind of really consider here is, let's say we're looking at sodium as we go this way, right? Each of these dots represents one atomic number. So if this is atomic number 11, this is atomic number 12, right? Between atomic number 11 and atomic number 12, you can notice here that there's basically a dip in ionization energy. Now that doesn't make any sense because it doesn't correlate with our ionization energy trend that we looked at, right? And the only reason it doesn't correlate with our ionization energy trend is because we are not considering something called subshell shielding. Okay, if we look at um, atomic number 11, uh, sorry, atomic number 12, sodium is atomic number 11. This is atomic number 12. Okay, so if we look at atomic number 12 versus atomic number 13, Right? Atomic number 12 here is magnesium. Okay? And if we look at the valence shell here, we're going to have um, neon. I'm going to do a condensed electron configuration. We're going to have neon uh, 3s2. Okay? So the 3s2, this is your valence shell, basically is an S subshell, and it's going to be spin pair. Now, aluminum, on the other hand, is 13. We're going to have neon 3s2, 3p1. So we all, the valence shell, so this is your 3s2 portion, and this is the 3p1 portion. And you can notice that we jump to a higher subshell. So now the subshell is actually will involve shielding, right? There's actually subshell shielding here, subshell shielding, and the subshell shielding will actually cause um, a weakening of the ionization energy, right? So let's use SS for subshell shielding. As the subshell shielding goes up, the effective nuclear charge actually diminishes, and the force of attraction diminishes, and as a result, the ionization energy diminishes. So even if aluminum is to the right of magnesium, because we've entered a new subshell in the same period, the ionization energy decreases. So there is exceptions to this rule, and the exception to the ionization energy trend is because of subshell shielding. It doesn't. It doesn't take into. Um, it doesn't take into effect this the presence of subshells, right? So this is really important to understand that these periodic trends are general ways that we can predict um, certain uh, certain certain chemical properties. But once again, they are not an exact measure for every case because there are other factors involved. So this notion of subshell shielding is very right. Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the power negative 34 meters squared per kilogram per second. Okay. So this is your Planck's constant, and then all you have to do is punch this out. So you have 6.626 times 10 to the power negative 34 um, times frequency, which is basically uh, 4.96 times 10 to the power 14 hertz, right? And the, the hertz, the seconds would cancel out if you wanted to look at the units. Hertz is one over seconds, right? So I'm just gonna get rid of the hertz, right? And basically the notion here is that it will basically cancel out and meters per kilogram is gonna give us uh, joules in energy. Now, the idea here is that um, the energy of the photon here is gonna be Thirty-two point eight six four nine, right? So I'm just multiplying these two together, and then you can add the powers. So times ten to the power negative thirty-four plus fourteen is negative twenty. So if I round this off, um, the energy of the photon here, and this is going to be in joules. So the energy of the photon here, if I move the decimal place here, I'm going to add one to the power, and you get three point two. Let's do nine times ten to the power negative nineteen joules. So you want to keep it in three significant digits. So that's the energy of a photon. Calculate the energy of one mole of photon. So this is the energy of the photon, or this is the energy per one photon, right? A mole of photons, 
So the energy per one photon is 3.26. Let's use a different color actually. Okay, so the energy of one photon is 3.29 times 10 to the power 19 joules per one photon. A mole of photons is basically 6.023 times 10 to the power 23 photons per mole. Okay, so the, you can see that if we use dimensional analysis here, if we multiply 3.29 times 6.023, we get 19.8157 uh, times 10 to the power negative 19 plus 23 is basically four uh, joules per one mole of photons. Okay, so this is the energy associated with one mole of photons. If you want to use uh, three significant digits, right? This is a nine, by the way. If you want to use three significant digits, I'm going to move this to 1.98. 1.98, so if I move the decimal place there, I'm going to subtract 1 here, times 10 to the power of 3 joules per 1 mole of photons. Okay, so this is the answer. That's the energy of 1 mole of photons. Alright, considering a photon with a wavelength of 605 nanometers, calculate the frequency of the wave in hertz, calculate the energy of the photon, and calculate the energy of 1 mole of photons. Okay, so if we want to calculate the frequency of the wave in hertz, uh, we know that photons make up light, light is a transverse wave, and therefore we can use the wave equation. So the wave equation V is equal to F lambda. We know that V here is equal to C, and C is the speed of light constant in vacuum. We can use a vacuum to simplify it, although the speed of light in air is a little bit slower. Right? So it's 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. And using this notion, C is equal to F lambda, we want to figure out the frequency of, of the wave in hertz. So in this case, um, frequency is equal to C over the lambda. We kind of divide by lambda to both sides. right? And in this case, we get 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. Now the wavelength we have is 605 nanometers. Now nanometer is basically 10 to the power negative 9 meters. And you can simplify this as 6.05. If I move the decimal place 2 to the left, right, you can basically add 2 to the power, so you get negative 7 meters, right? So you want to change this into meters. So the frequency here is 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. And you want to divide this by 6.05 times 10 to the power negative 7 meters. And the frequency is going to have a unit of hertz, so I'm just going to uh, calculate this guy out. If you're calculating this, uh, I would just kind of divide these two numbers first and then work with the powers, right? So you can see that the meters would cancel out. And when you do that, I'm going to get here. So 3 divided by 6.05 is 0 0.49599 times uh, 10 to the power 8 minus, minus 7 is 10 to the power 15. And you can see that you get 1 over seconds, which is a hertz, right? And what you want to do is you want to simplify this. I'm going to move the decimal place 1 to the right, so I'm going to subtract uh, 1 from the power. So you get 4.959 times 10 to the power 14 uh, hertz, which is 1 over seconds. And what you want to do is, because we are given three significant digits in the question, I'm going to simplify this to 4.96 times 10 to the power 14 hertz. Okay, so this is the frequency. Part B here is the energy of the photon, of one photon. We know that the energy of a photon, we can use this equation, HF, right? Maybe I'll use a different color here so we can kind of differentiate from the first question. The energy of the photon here is H, which is Planck's constant, times the frequency. We know that Planck's constant here is 6.626 times 10 to the power negative 34. Okay, considering chromium-24 and uh, bromine-35, compare the two in terms of atomic radius, electronegativity, electron affinity. Uh, let's start with atomic radius. So the atomic radius, we know that for the increasing trend, uh, atomic radius increases to the left of a period and down a group, right? Um, and in this case, uh, if we take a look at a periodic table, I'm just going to insert that really quickly.
Okay, so here's our periodic table, and we can notice here that uh, brom bromine is located right here, and chromium is located right here. And you can see that they're found on the same period. So because bromine is to the right of period four, so the valence shell is the fourth energy level, we can say that the atomic radius of chromium should be greater than the atomic radius of bromine, and we can use this notion for chromium Right, the atomic number is lower, so as a result, the nuclear charge is lower. And because the nuclear charge is lower, the effective nuclear charge is lower. And because the effective nuclear charge is lower, the force of attraction that governs the valence electrons is also lower. And because the force of attraction is lower, the kinetic energy of these electrons are higher. So if the kinetic energy of the electrons are higher, the electrons can move further away, thereby increasing the radius of the atom, right? So the the atomic radius is the distance from the nucleus to the valence shell. Well, now the valence shell can shift outwards, right? So that's why the atomic radius of chromium should be greater than bromine, right? Let's take a look at electronegativity. So we know that electronegativity will increase to the right of a period and up a group, right? Using this trend, we can notice that bromine is located to the right of this period. So we can say that the electronegativity of bromine is greater than the electronegativity of chromium, and this is because of the fact that there is more protons in bromine. As a result, there is a higher effective nuclear charge, right? So a higher nuclear charge, um, being the fact that there is more protons, means a higher effective nuclear charge. Because we have a higher effective nuclear charge, we have a stronger force of attraction, as shown, right? I'm just gonna go to that. So there's a stronger force of attraction, and because there's a stronger force of attraction there should be a higher electronegativity. So this is in uh, correspondence with bromine. Okay, so that's the uh, explanation between that. And then for part three, we're gonna look at electron affinity. So it's good to understand that electron affinity is equal to the kinetic energy of an electron in free space minus the barrier energy, right? So we can understand that as the barrier energy decreases because this is constant, Right, this is a very simplified view of electron affinity. Electron affinity is the energy released when an electron is added. Right? If this decreases, then this is going to increase. Right? So if the electron affinity increases, uh, then more energy is released, and it's easier to add an electron in. Okay, so having said that, the trend for electron affinity, we stated earlier, the trend for electron affinity, electron affinity increases to the right of a period and of a group. Okay, so if we're looking at electron affinity here and we're looking at the periodic table, we can see that bromine is located to the right of the period in respect to chromium. And as a result, I would predict that the electron affinity of bromine is greater than the electron affinity of chromium. So that therefore it's it's to say that we can add electrons a lot more easier to bromine than chromium, right? More energy gets released. So that's in, that indicates that this is a more of a spontaneous process. Now let's explain this. If we're looking at bromine, right, uh, atomic number 35, the atomic number increases to the right of a period, and as a result, the nuclear charge will increase. So bromine has a plus 35 nuclear charge. As a result, the effective nuclear charge, because the nuclear charge increased, the effective nuclear charge is also higher. And because the effective nuclear charge is higher, the force of attraction for that electron for for its valence electrons, for any of its electrons, for external electrons, is also going to be higher. And because the force of attraction for electrons is higher, thereby it's easier to add an electron into the system. So this actually diminishes the barrier energy. So as the force of attraction is higher, barrier energy is lower. Because the barrier energy is lower, now it's easier to add an electron in, and as a result, more energy gets released. So this is kind of correspondence with this notion that we talked about here. So that's why the electron affinity is higher. Okay, Bohr is attempting to predict uh, hydrogen emission spectra by using the equation change in energy is equal to negative 2.18 times 10 to the power of negative 18 over 1 over uh, times 1 over n squared final minus 1 over n squared initial. If an electron whose ground state is n is equal to 2 gains energy and jumps to a higher energy state of n is equal to 4, predict the wavelength that is released. So recall that Bohr's emission spectra equation would look at 
adding energy into an electron. An electron would jump from its lowest energy state, ground state, to a higher energy state, its um, excited state, right? So n is the energy level, right? And we know that n is equal to, this is our ground state of energy, its lower energy state, right? And when you add energy in, now it's going to jump n is equal to 4, which is the excited state. So let's figure out how much energy was absorbed. But we know that these jumps are temporary, right? And because these jumps are temporary, the electron that jumps to the excited state will fall back down to the ground state. That energy gets released in a certain number of photons. And those photons will have a particular uh, wavelength and frequency. Now that wavelength that we will see is actually part of the visible light spectrum. It's a wavelength that our eyes can detect. As a result, a certain color gets an emitted, right? So this is why we call it the emission spectra. Now, so in this case, um, let's calculate how much energy gets uh, changed. So the change in energy here, I'm just going to write it out. I'm going to use the equation here. So negative 2.18 times 10 to the power negative 18, 1 over n squared final. So this is your excited state, minus 1 over n squared uh, initial okay so in this case we have negative 2.18 times 10 to the power negative 18 times and the final state here was 4 squared minus the initial state n is equal to 2 from ground state 2 squared and if we calculate this we get negative 2.18 times 10 to the power negative 18 times 1 over 16 minus 1 over 4 let's change um, Let's change the uh, denominator here. So we get negative 2.18 times 10 to the power negative 18. 1 over 16. I'm going to multiply this by 4 and this by 4 to make a common denominator. So we get negative 4 over 16, which is negative 2.18 times 10 to the power negative 18, negative 3 over 16. Now what you guys can do here is you can change this to a decimal, um, although it is going to um, make your answer a little less accurate we are only going to be rounding our answers to about two significant three significant digits right so once again these are just ballpark values right so um, let's uh, multiply this out now when you do that um, I'm just going to multiply three times uh, 2.18 so 3 over 16 times 2.18 and we get 0 0.40875 times 10 to the power negative 18 so you can notice that the negatives would cancel out right because the um, there's two negatives here and the chain of energy is approximately 0 0.40875 times 10 to the uh, power negative 18 now if I move decimal place uh, to the right I'm just going to uh, subtract 1 to the power so we get 4.0875 times 10 to the power negative 19 and if we change um, this value outwards right uh, we can notice here that this is basically uh, 4.09 times 10 to the power negative 19 joules. Now, once we have the energy, what we want to do here is we want to figure out the wavelength. Now, we have the energy of a series of photons. Let's say this is the energy of one photon, right? So we are looking at specifically um, one, uh, one photon that gets released, right? So this is the energy of one photon, and then we know that the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times its frequency, right? And as a result, we know Planck's constant here is 6.626 times 10 to the power negative 34 kilograms per meter squared per second, right? So if we use this in our equation out here, and I wanted to solve for frequency, um, you, could, you could do that. Now, we want to keep it in wavelength, and we know that there, there is a relationship between frequency and wavelength. So instead of writing frequency, according to a wave equation, V is equal to F lambda, Frequency is equal to V over lambda, and V here is equal to C, so we get C over lambda. And as a result, the energy of a photon is equal to the Planck's constant H times C over lambda. Okay, so we want to solve for lambda, so if we um, change this equation around, I'm going to divide by H to both sides, right, and then you basically get C over lambda is equal to energy of the photon over Planck's constant, if I do the reciprocal here, the wavelength is basically 
wavelength over over C, the speed of light here is equal to Planck's constant over the energy of the photon. And if you multiply C to both sides, the wavelength is equal to the speed of light constant times Planck's constant over the energy of the photon. So let's plug all our values in here. You get 3.0 times 10 to the power um, 8 meters per second times 6.626 times 10 to the power um, negative 34 kilograms per meters squared per second, right? And you also get energy of the photon here is basically what we calculate is 4.09 times 10 to the power negative 19 joules. So if I plug all of this in and I calculate this, what I'm going to get here is, and working with just the numbers, the 3 and the 6.626 and the 4.09 here, I got 4.86 times 10 to the power 8 times 10 to the power negative 34. You just add the powers here, so you get 10 to the power negative 26. You're going to divide that by 10 to the power negative 19. So you get 4.86 times um, negative 26 minus minus 19, so 10 to the power negative 7. And wavelength is going to be found in meters. So this is approximately 486 nanometers. And that's going to be basically found in this range here. So the wavelength that gets released is going to have a blue hue. Or a blue okay, so let's draw an orbital diagram with an appropriate scale for rubidium um, 37. What is indicative of it being an alkaline metal? Write its elect uh, condensed electron configuration. Write the electron. Uh, circle the electron E1 with the following quantum numbers. Circle the electron E2 with the following quantum numbers. Which of these two electrons are more reactive? Okay, so let's, let's kind of go through this. Um, what is indicative of being an alkaline metal? Well, if we look at rubidium here, I'm just going to write out its condensed electron configuration, right? So if we look at its condensed electron configuration, rubidium is located in period 5, so we can use krypton as the noble gas, and then we have 5s1. So because the valence shell, which is the fifth energy shell, has one electron, right? It's an alkaline metal because it has one valence electron. One valence electron. So it has, it's an alkaline metal because it has one valence electron, and we've written out its condensed electron configuration. So, therefore, alkali metal. And this is basically why it's found in group one. Okay, it's a metal because um, the metals are found on the left side, right? Um, so we did A and B. Circle the electrons. So let's do the um, orbital diagram now. So we're doing the orbital diagram. I'm going to do energy on the y-axis. So this is like energy. Sorry. Yeah. Hey. So this is energy on the y-axis. So this is energy. And then I'm going to create an axis here. And in this case, you can notice that if we wanted to create the electron configuration, what would help us is our full electron. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at drawing the orbital diagram. Let's construct the orbital diagram for rubidium 37. So I'm going to put energy on the y-axis, and to help us to construct the orbital diagram, I'm going to create the electron configuration. So rubidium 37 is basically using the periodic table. I'm going to move the helium out here, so I'm just going to move it this way, right, so you get 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then from the fourth energy sh uh, level we go to the d sub show, and to d sub show is n minus 1, 4s2, 3d10, because we cover all of this all the way up to zinc. So this is 3d10. And then we're still in the fourth energy level. We got 4p6, and then 5s1. Okay, so the valence shell here, all of this, right, all of this is a core electron shell, and that's basically indicated by krypton. And then we have our valence shell here is going to be 5s1. Okay, so let's construct this on our orbital diagram. So if we're constructing this on our orbital diagram, we have 
1s, 2. Okay, so spin paired, then 2s, 2, spin paired, right? And in the second energy level, we also have the p sub shell, so I'm just going to then have the space for p sub shell, right? I'm going to half fill first and then spin pair, so this is 2p6. Then indent another space for the next energy level, we have 3s2. Okay, then we have 3p6, so I'm going to indent another space here, so this is 3p6. Half fill first, and then spin pair, that's what we have here. And then we jump to the fourth energy level, we have 4s2. That's also spin paired. But we can also notice that there is also the presence of a 3D subshell, which is going to be a little bit higher than the fourth energy shell. Okay, so this is the D subshell, so this is 3D10. And I'm going to draw this guy out. Okay, half fill first. Oops. Half fill first, and then spin pair. Okay, and then after the 3D, we have 4P, so it's going to be a bit higher than this. Okay, so let's call this like 4P6. Half fill these guys, and then spin pair. Right, I know I can, you can kind of notice that I messed up the scale here a little bit because of how close these two were. Um, and then 5S2. Okay, sorry, 5S1 change that, 5s1, so this is the valence shell. So this here is the valence shell, okay, so here's your valence shell. And if you want, we can characterize all the other shells out here, all right, there's a shell here, there's a third shell, second shell, first shell, right, so this is n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 3, right, n is equal to 4, and in this case, um, n is equal to 5. Okay, So those, those are our shells. Now, what the question is asking us to do here is uh, we want to circle the electron, E1, with the following quantum numbers. n is equal to 4, L is equal to 2. Let's use that. Let's do that in red. n is equal to 4, so we're in the fourth energy level. L is equal to 2, we're in the P subshell. Um, sorry, we're in the D subshell. Now, this, there should be a typo here. L cannot equal 2 because there is no 4D here, so this should be 1. I think there was a, a typo. So L is equal to 1, and ML is equal to 1. So ML here is, uh, if L is equal to 1 when the P subshell, ML can be negative 1, 0, and positive 1, and MS is negative 1 half. I'm going to say the downward arrow is, whoops, not that one. We're looking at this orbital, and specifically it's the one that's going down. So this is um, the negative 1 half. And so this is, we're going to call this guy electron 1, right? It's going down this way. Circle the electron, electron 2, with the following quantum numbers, n is equal to two, l is equal to 1. Let's use a different color here. Um, these yellow. Uh, following quantum numbers, n is equal to l is equal to 1. We're also in the P subshell. ml is equal to 0, so this is negative 1, 0, 1. And ms is 1 half, so this is positive 1 half. Right, so this is electron 2, which is going up this way. And if we want to look at which one's more reactive, which one has more energy, we can say that the energy of electron 1 should be greater than the energy of electron 2 because of the fact that this guy is found in the fourth energy shell versus the second energy shell. Right, so the shell number is greater. When the shell number is greater, then we also have uh, more shielding. Right, so we have more shielding. As a result, we have a higher separation distance and a lower effective nuclear charge, lower force of attraction, and higher kinetic energy. So if we have higher kinetic energy, that means that we're going to tend to see that it's more reactive. Okay, so that's the idea. The electron uh, one is going to be higher in energy or more reactive than electron two.